Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for attending uh, CU Answers University Class 2.0, Employee Security. My name is Jim Vilker. I will be your instructor for the next hour or so, depending upon questions. Um, as you join today, uh, as you'll notice, you were put automatically on mute. We do that to just uh, eliminate background noise and any interruptions. So we're going to use the chat feature uh, this morning. And you can find the chat by hovering over the bottom of the presentation screen. You should then see the toolbar with a series of icons. Click on the one that says chat and then select your presenter and type your questions. Um, I'll stop at any time of this morning during this presentation and I'll try to answer questions as they come in uh, based upon the number of questions that are actually going to be coming in. Uh, there were a lot more people signed up for this class than are actually signed in at this moment, but I think I'm going to get started. Uh, based upon the week of Christmas, I can definitely see why huh, maybe CU Answers University isn't on the top of everybody's mind. Uh, so with that said, let's, let's just get started. So the basics for employee security here um, is tool 327. Uh, the question that you should all have in your mind is in the credit union, who actually has access to tool 327? And you have identified security officers that you've actually told CU Answers that they are your security officers. 327 just shouldn't be given to people without at least allowing us to know who those people are that can actually change permissions. Generally, um, 327, is given to C-level and in many cases uh, is in your IT department. But the granting of 327 has to be done thoughtfully. And what I mean by thoughtfully is the, the individual has to have a grasp of the operations. Uh, and when I say that, um, I'm referring to does the tool pose risk by virtue of them having other tools, i.e improper segregation of duty. Uh, Audit Link does 12 to 15 uh, employee security reviews. It's a paid for service a year for credit unions. It is a requirement uh, as it relates to the FFIC and it is on the exam checklist that you're doing annual reviews of these. That's why Audit Link gets called to the table many times. Uh, I would say the majority of times because it showed up in your exam. So I'm going to take a little different tack this morning as it relates to the granting. Yes, we're going to go through the tools. We're going to go through all the buttons that are there, the profile analysis. But I'm going to inject a little bit more practicality on when granting, um, what should you be considering? <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm in test credit union. Uh, so none of this is real. So in some cases, I might be doing some things that just look silly, but I'll explain as we go through. The first thing to understand um, when, you, when you go into uh, Tool 327 is that each and every one of these columns is sortable. Uh, and that's important to understand because as you're working it, this can get rather cluttered. And we're going to talk about what we do when an employee is either termed or leaves uh, the employment of the credit union, because it's important for security officers to understand, get them out of the production system, archive them. When do we archive them? So if I click on ID, it'll sort high to low, name, low, high to low, and job classification, and then team. So when, when I say teams, we're going to talk extensively about templates today. Over the last two years, we've made a number of changes to this tool, um, all by request of credit unions and by the request of security officers to make it a little bit easier to understand and easier to audit because aud the audit functionality is important. Let's start then with employee profile. Employee profile is what's built at the time the individual becomes employed at the credit union. You've reached out to client services. They've generated a gold 
uh, sign on for them, giving them a temporary task, uh, password. What's changed here? Well, the first thing that's changed is this is a template. So you all have templates. Everybody on this call, with the exception of the CU Answers employee, <laughs> Michelle, um, most of you have been assigned to a template or are assigning teams to a template. If I click on that button, and I won't on this one, it falls off of the production view and it goes into your template view. Um, I would encourage you for your takeaways, and you know me, for those of you who have been on uh, any of my classes, I, I hope you're taking notes and the takeaway, first takeaway, is go in, review the templates, send them back into the templates where they belong. Assigning a template to a team member in the profile is designed to do one thing. Templates are the line in the sand. And what I mean by that is at some point in time, you sat down and you said, what are the tools we should assign to a new teller? And you thoughtfully went through that. So when another teller is hired, you copy the template. And I'll go back into that again. Uh, I'm just gonna go teller team. You copy that to the employee that you're hiring and you also copy special settings and tool assignments. Why do you do that? You do that for this one reason. If you just said, well, Jim replaced Laura, Laura was a teller. Let's copy Laura's uh, assignments to Jim. Laura had been at the credit union for 10 years. And over those 10 years, you assigned Laura special projects. She may have moved, she was an MSR, and then she became a teller, so on and so forth. By copying Laura's rights to Jim, you've now given Jim five years of right assignment to Laura. You're not keeping things on the same playing field. So that is the true reason for the templates. And I would encourage you to take a look and, we'll, and I'm gonna show you how to compare an individual to what your template says, because that's the audit function that you should take away. And that will be a takeaway from today. So again, Tim test, employee profile, review, make sure that they have a template and that they have a job classification. And that job classification is designed for one reason as well. Audit link does, like I said, 12 to 15, if not more security engagements a year with credit unions. Over the years, we've kind of developed a system. What is generally given to these people? So what we did was we said, let's create job classifications that Audit Link has reviewed already. And you can compare your team templates to those job classifications. That's new as well. So there's a lot of things that I'm gonna be going over today that you're going, no, I never heard of something like that. Well, that's why we have CU Answers University. Now, if I go back in, there's account security. What's account security all about? Well, account security creates a situation where that two digit ID can actually view that account, but they can't post or maintain to that account. Why is that important? Well, you don't want your employees having or being, having the capability to post or to do file maintenance on their account, but you do want them to be able to do an inquiry. We've got some credit unions that say no to all three. And if they wanna see their account, they need to go into home banking and understand how to use it. I agree with that statement, but that's policy more than it is anything else. From a practical standpoint, uh, what credit, most credit unions do 
is number one, instruct MSRs. If you're opening an account for an employee or adding them as a joint owner, you need to alert your security officers to say, now we need to set up account security. That be first. Second, annually, um, send out a notice to all staff and it says, please list all of your accounts that you are either owner of or joint on. And then there's a security report that you compare that to. And it, it, to get that deep into the weeds, I will show you how to get to the security report. Um, I won't be running it this morning. That's simply, we don't have enough time in an hour to do that. <clears throat> but account security is important. <clears throat> and many times when I do security audits, what I find is that's probably where it got a little loose. Yeah, we used to do that. We do that sometimes, but we don't always do it. Um, what about employee type code? Uh, are you adding that uh, to the actual uh, individual account? Um, and that is important as well, so that when you're doing your audit of uh, employee activity, those accounts are picked up when you're taking the tool to review the activity in that account. The copy command. If I highlight Tim and go to copy, now, it says, do I want to copy this from Tim to another employee? Or do I want to copy this from Tim to a team code? What's the difference? If I copy that Tim to an employee, all of Tim's rights go to that employee. Done. If I copy it to a team code, anybody who has that specific team code, the TL, in their team right here, automatically gets all of those rights. So you don't have to do it one at a time. And that's important to understand. And that should be done at least once a year, where you just draw a line in the sand and say, you know what? It's time. Let's make sure, let's make sure things didn't get out of hand. Now, there's a few caveats to that. If you're going to do that, and you haven't been using team codes, my suggestion to you is this. Pick somebody assigned to that team. In this case, let's pick Tim. And we're gonna evaluate Tim against the template. And I'll show you how to do that here in a second. You're gonna update Tim and maybe Janet and John and Marvin, and I call them your guinea pigs. You're going to say, today's the day. We're going to update you, and we're going to let you roll around with those new permissions for one week. The minute that you do that, without updating the team code, um, the minute that you do that, though, the next time the individual signs on, what you want them to do is to say, show me my favorites. Make sure none of those are grayed out. Um, and then understand, well, no, I don't have this anymore, but that was based upon a special project. Everybody can't be the same. And unfortunately, the smaller the credit unions get, the harder it is to maintain a consistency between the team and the employee. It, it, it's just the way it is. Uh, you have five employees, they're gonna wear multiple hats. Yeah, I do teller, but mm, I do accounts payable, I might do this, I might do that. Understandable. So again, the smaller you get, the harder it is to maintain consistency. Now, I'm going to copy special security, which we're going to go over here in a minute, and I'm going to copy all tool assignments. That basically replaces everything that they had and gets it new. Now, if you're going to pick a guinea pig and you're just going to update them and you're going to let them roll around for a week, and they're going to communicate back to you on, hey, I really needed this. And then you have to say why. Um, you know, the one big thing, one of my biggest pet peeves is everybody having print miscellaneous checks. Um, for those of you who know, who don't know me, um, I bring that up frequently because you're allowing an employee to cut a check out of a general ledger that may or may not be reconciled. And that scares the hell out of me. So um, you take that away and they go, well, I needed that. Well, what did you need it for? 
so you need to grill these people. Never do this on a Friday if that employee works on Saturday, unless the security uh, the security person is available. Um, never do this on a Monday. Um, I always say, never do it the day before a holiday. Um, I always say, if you're going to start making changes and start drawing that line in the sand, Tuesday's your good day um, because that gives that individual the rest of the week to play around. Now, so they go for a week and everything is hunky dory. Well, then what you would do is you would copy Tim Test to the template, then copy the template to everybody that's been assigned that team. Now, don't start any of this until you evaluate should they be a part of that team. Here's the other thing that's new is merge in new assignments. Well, why, when did you use that? Um, Jim's a teller and aspires to become an MSR, but needs both rights for a period of time. Or you're going from uh, MSRs not having teller ability Teller line ability to everybody, everybody becoming an MSR. You can merge a template into Tim Test. Tim's a teller, but now Tim needs MSR rights. So you would copy MSR into Tim, and instead of replace, you would use merge. Like I said, if you didn't know that existed, don't be worried. A lot of this is new. We've been making a lot of changes to this over the year. Now, special security. This, this is relative to tools, but think of it as processes. And do, can they open an account? Which means if they're in opening account, can they even take the tool? Close accounts, file maintenance. And let's be very clear about file maintenance. <coughs> file maintenance in and of itself, just that first one right here, allows the individual to change member demographic information. File maintenance level tier two allows the individual to change data associated with the member that the system needs to process information. So it's the next layer. Um, the differences would be, I can change Jim's name and file maintenance, but I can't change the interest rate on his loan, the next payment due date, the maturity date, uh, the interest rate on the CD. So think of it that way. And if you're curious, don't try to remember this, but if you're curious, just go and hover over the little eye and it's gonna pop up and it's gonna show you the fields that it actually allows you or allows them to grant. I can't, I'm only sharing gold right now and it would come up in, uh, in HTML. Um, so think of it that way. Teller overwrite speaks for itself. Um, loan underwriting, what does that do? Well, two things. Number one, there's a control functionality on the system. And you either choose to do it or you don't, and you can't actually do it. You have to call client services to turn it on. And what that control functionality uh, creates is a situation where I can status a loan as approved. However, if this, this is checked, if it's not checked, I can't status the loan as approved. It won't even let me do it. Now, if it's unchecked, I'm a loan interviewer, and that really only has to do with the control. It means I can take an application, but I can't put an approval code on it. Creates some hmm, headaches in credit unions because if you turn the control on and the member changes their mind, it has to go all the way back to the underwriter for them to edit it and update it. And then you have to have the loan officer then actually has to close it. Not a lot of credit unions use it. And it was really designed for a centralized underwriting environment. But loan underwriting does one other thing. 
it allows you to set loan limits. If that box isn't checked, you can't set loan limits. Um, and loan limits do not copy from one individual to another. They have to be granted. Use app check. What is use app check? That is the, uh, the functionality in the system where when you're putting an application on, if you have it configured, um, requires them to enter information on specific fields. And you can say required or not necessary. You don't even have to have it. Again, a lot of credit unions simply don't know it exists. And if that's something that you're interested in, I would strongly recommend you reach out to uh, Pete Winninger and Lender VP. Uh, it's a really nice function of the system, especially for new loan officers, but not widely used. Time cards. Yes, there's a time card platform built into CU Bank. Uh, most credit unions have gone now to just the icon that goes to ADP or whatever, but in the event you wanted to use it, you could. Open loan speaks for itself. Unpost general ledger entry. Eh, eh, who gets that? Well, you would think the CFO would have that. Um, and, and that might be the case, but understand unpost entry was really designed for this. Not everybody in accounting should be able to unpost, but somebody should be able to approve the unpost. So I'm responsible for the reconciliation of a specific account. I, I made a mistake. I unpost the entry and I wanna update it and repost it. Taking the unpost entry uh, would be done by the individual doing the reconcilement or the settlement. But putting in your two digit ID and password should be done by somebody else. Now, most accounting departments would say, hell no. Do you know how much longer that would take? But what I'm telling you is that's the way the system was designed, <laughs> regardless of how you use it. Phone operator speaks for itself. Uh, require wrap up codes has to do with phone op. And when they go in and actually put a tracker record on, and then view credit report speaks for itself and instant card issue, I think speaks for itself. So those will copy over with the two digit ID, as long as you hit that button. Hitting Tim again, new, this is new. Tim leaves. First thing you're gonna do is go in here and lock the ID. Do not, do not remove tool assignments. Removing tool assignments creates a precarious situation. Tim Test leaves. Eight months later, a member calls and says, there's something weird on my account. And the two digit ID on that account belongs to Tim Test. And he seemed to be doing the transactions, the account adjustments, whatever else. If you remove his tool assignments, I." Uh, and then you have to do forensics, you won't know where to start. Well, you can say, I think you had the teller template. Did he? Or did he have pet projects that he was doing as well? So uh, permanently lock immediately. Nobody can use that ID. You can't reset the password. Um, it's impossible. Now, what's the difference between that and the other two options? Archive actually takes it out of production and puts it into an archive database, which means you can use that two digit ID again. When you archive it, it preserves the tools that were assigned. So uh, that is, that, and a lot of that is, is, is relatively new. Before I move on then, I need to talk a little bit about what happens when Tim gets termed. So the first thing that you would do is you would go into the employee profile and you would put a ZZ in front of the name. This came up, I, I was taught this by Sioux Empire Credit Union. I thought it was the neatest thing that I've ever heard. And this was within the last six months. Why do I do that? Because if you're gonna leave him in the production in a locked environment, if you put a ZZ in front of his name and you sort by name, 
Tim goes to the bottom. Take away, put ZZ in all of your term employees that you have not archived. Secondly, remove the team code. Um, you never want to update. If, you, if Tim stays in production, even in a locked environment, and you update TL and then you copy it to everybody in there, Tim's going to get new assignments. So first of all, ZZ, remove TL. And yes, this is being recorded in case you're not. You're going, Jim, I can't remember all this, and you're talking too fast, which I understand I got a bad habit of, but that will happen. Um, I got uh, Terry. Can we run a report by social security number for all employees so we can identify which accounts have employees on? Yes, I can. And I'll show you that here in a minute, Terry. We'll, we'll take a look at the reports. Good question. The other thing, if you have roaming tellers, somebody's not winning the argument. And typically that means the security officer cannot explain to the head teller how it's supposed to work. Half a dozen years ago, you didn't have the capability to assign multiple vaults to employees. That was over six years ago. So we attacked that and said, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the butt. I mean, you got to go in, you got to update the vault, um, or you have to have roaming tellers where everybody uses a drawer and you have two digit ID. Well, that's a risky environment in and of itself. Uh, that's no longer necessary. You can assign multiple vaults to an individual. The only thing they have to do is sign out of one to go into another, period. That's it. <clears throat> so if you're losing that argument, reach out to either Marvin or myself because I want to help you win that argument. And the argument is this. That two-digit ID has a password that's shared. I've seen roving teller with file maintenance capability. Well, who really did it? Do it, it, you understand the risk associated with that is it, it, it's a common known password on an ID. And it creates a situation where people can do things anonymously, which you never want, especially as it relates to file maintenance. So again, takeaway, are you using roving tellers? And if you are, Let's bring it back up and let's win the argument to get rid of them all together. So the employee's term, you've locked the ID. When do I archive it? <laughs> Understand when you archive an ID that there are certain inquiries and certain reports that look to the production employee security database for that two digit ID and then populate the name on the report or the inquiry. Um, loan, new loan report, things like that. If you move it to archive, it's blank and it will be blank immediately. Most of the time that's not a problem because you can look back to the archival and say, yeah, it was Jim and it happened during the time of his employment because we have a termination date. Don't think that all is lost. That's not the case. All is not lost. But if I were the head of lending and I wanted to get print a trial balance of my loans, um, I probably want to know that even though Jim left a year ago, I want to see Jim's name. As think of it this way, then as you move up the food chain, it's usually it stays in lock status a, a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer. My recommendation to you is don't remove them no less than during an audit period, 12 to 18 months. A teller you could remove in 12 to 18 months. MSR, depending upon the authorities that they had, you know, 18 months. But when you get into the lending and you get into other areas of operations, you may want to bump that up. Now, there's credit unions on this call right now who have a lot of employees. They're running out of two-digit IDs. That's going to be the force that creates, that pushes that down. So kind of think of it in that regard as though, you know, we're going to leave them in an archive status, but at some point we need to review them and maybe just have a policy or, how do I hate policies, um, have a procedure where you say, oh, Tim's been out there long enough, time to archive them and get them out of there. Now, 
You can view the profile, you can reset password. We have other navs down here. You can actually highlight Tim and view maintenance that was performed on Tim. You can do a profile analysis. What's a profile analysis? Nope, oh, because I'm in bedrock, and it's not going to work. Let me get back there. A profile analysis is new, and that basically shows you what people have, what tools, and what the freak. And then we have another uh, that I'll hopefully will work to show you how many times tools are used. This was changed. So if you haven't gone in there in a while, I definitely go in here. A lot of credit unions don't even know this exists. Well, so you answer sets the timeout. Well, we do on the password to get into goal, but you set it as it relates to the two digit ID. So again, have you looked at this? Is your credit union actually said, um, don't ever change the password. That's not going to fly, at least in the state of Michigan. Um, I can guarantee you that won't fly in the state of Michigan and in most other states. They need to expire. What's the recommended expiration? You know, two months at the most, I would say. Uh, it, it, maybe 30 days. All depends. Uh, if you haven't been expiring passwords, get ready for the B factor. Um, because people are going to go, what in the hell? I'm like, continuously changing this damn thing. And then allow auto security. And to be honest, I don't know why you wouldn't allow auto security for all employees. The only consideration on auto security is if it's a shared terminal, um, which basically somebody signs in and, and if they walked away, um, the other person has the rights to it. I would drive ups are about the only one that I can see where you would say if they're a drive up teller is about the only time that I would say that. Want to make sure there's no other chats. I must be doing a good job. Any questions so far before I move on? Okay, well, let's move on. Alan needs some new tools. So you've now gone in. This is where you're going to assign tools. And you can search for that specific tool. You don't need to know the tool number and the search functionality is pretty robust. You can say, I need to assign, or wait, Alan's in accounting. Does Alan have everything Alan needs? Or Alan's an auditor. I can say, just show all the auditing tools. Was he assigned them or not? Again, this is how you would kind of do an audit as well. Now, what I do when I go in here is I go in and say, show assigned. And let me go back. I want to pick on a teller. Not that. Let's see. So I want to say, show assigned. Why did I do that? Remember what I referred to prior to this? is if you're ever going to audit this, this is going to default because a, a job classification was assigned to Joe. So he's got all this access, yet the job classification of teller says he probably shouldn't. Now, I wouldn't necessarily depend on job class as much as I depend on the teller template. Oh, we've got a lot of tough stuff going on. So what you're looking at in an audit, Joe's got it, but your template says he should. See what I'm getting at here? Why? <laughs> That's the audit question. Why? So again, this is where you would go in and say, 2021, I got a project. We're going to do a self-audit. And we're going to engage audit link. Not as a paid for service, but you're going to reach out to Marvin and I to say, we're going to get started. Just get the wheels rolling, the methodology. Knock on wood, by the end of January, everything that we're training today is going to be in a booklet. Um, I've been trying to pull all of this out of um, Marvin and I's collective brains here. 
and get it in a booklet where you can actually use it. And that's coming. So you would go through and just evaluate why, 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 why. And then you would assign the additional tool. Now, the other thing is these, like I said before, these are all actually um, sortable. So I want to sort on number of employees. Take away, write this down, go in and sort on number of employees, find out how many tools you've never assigned an employee to. And there will be some. <laughs> uh, dashboards and things like that. But there will be some. Now, don't get too excited. There are custom, and when I mean custom, menus that are available uh, to just specific credit unions are listed in there. You might have tried to assign it. It's not going to go to that individual. Um, don't worry about it. You're going to go, oh, you know, that was for Kellogg, and I just gave it to Allegan. No, don't worry about that. that. The program doesn't live in the library, even though you, you, you assigned it. So don't get real concerned but you will see some in there. So, but again, um, this is just a, a very simple methodology on how do I evaluate it? The other thing, show unassigned. Um, so Jim Vilker is the CFO. I wanna go to show unassigned, and then I wanna categorize it by analysis category. Does Jim have all the analysis tools he should have? Now, and it's always interesting because when I'm hired or to do it or, and I walk in, the first thing that goes in the back of the mind is you're just going to strip everybody of everybody's authority. That's not so. That, that is absolutely not so. It's a give and take. It's a, man, that, you know, that tool, that dashboard or that analytical piece of the platform came out two years ago. And Jim should have had it 24 months ago. Let's give it to Jim now. And then have Jim go back in and say, all available tools. And go, wow. So make this as much of a positive event as a negative. It should not be a negative event. Although, my experience is this. The people who get the angriest when an audit is done is people in collections, because they believe they should be able to do just about anything they want to a member's account. And for some reason, people in mortgage underwriting, because they have to have file maintenance, there's a lot of things mortgage underwriting has to do. One of the people that would surprise you that has some of the most is if you have this position, is a loan processor. So only because they're doing a lot. Unfortunately for us, the reason why I have a pet peeve about print miscellaneous checks is many times a loan processor needs to have that. And please just don't go back. The last time I did this, I got calls from CEOs saying, Jim, you told my security officer to take print, print miscellaneous checks away from everybody. And this has just got the credit union in a hill of a room. Please don't do that. I don't want those calls. From, I don't like those calls from CEOs. <laughs> so just don't, because I said it, just don't blanket take everything away. But unfortunately for that loan processor, she knew what she was doing. She knew what GLs to hit. And she took a very wonderful trip to Mexico on the credit union's expense account um, by printing miscellaneous checks. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as well. Now, usage analysis. So how many times is a tool taken? This is, you know, this is very interesting. And then the number of employees who have this tool and show assigned, show assigned employees about this tool. Who's got it? Why do you need to know that? Because you need to understand who has access to what. Now, is there a report that shows you that? Absolutely. There is a report. This is new. I, I keep saying that. We've put a lot of work and a lot of investment into employee security over the last few years. And it, it, it continues. Um, one of the things, and, and I, if IT is in the mix, and they generally are as far as tool assignments go, and they don't know a lot about the credit union operations, and the CFO comes to IT and says, give Jim, he's one of my workers, give Jim this tool. And how do IT goes, what the hell? I don't even know what that tool does. 
just click about this tool. There's a full description about what every tool does on the system. So don't be guessing and don't be saying, well, I don't know if I should give it to Jim and because I don't really know what it's going to do. Well, you, you, you got to understand we're trying to educate you as well as, as assist you in understanding all the different processes on the, on the platform itself. So now, what does an audit look like? So the audit starts like this. Pick a teller. Well, no, let's back up. First thing, sort by team. This is after you've cleaned them all up, right? All the termed ones are now locked. They have the ZZ. You've removed the team indicator. That would be your first, uh, your first duty, second duty. Make sure these people actually are in this team. Now, and don't create teams for one person. Those are called one-offs. Everybody's not going to be assigned a team. It's just the way it is. Um, they need to be inspected independently. Now, here's the other thing. Yep, Joe's a teller, and Joe is tasked by the CFO to work accounts payable invoices. So you're not going to give everybody that is a teller work accounts payable invoices. So when you draw the line in the sand, you have to understand you're always going to step on some people and you're going to have to give stuff back to them. That's just the way it is. Um, I know some credit unions keep a spreadsheet to say, here's everything that this two digit ID has outside the general po profile. So they know immediately if they take things, if they update the template and copy the template over, um, it would go to everybody. So again, the first thing, make sure the teams are assigned appropriately. Once that's done, then you're gonna go to Joe, Joe's the guinea pig, you're gonna assign tools to Joe, you're gonna compare him to the teller template to make sure that he hasn't gotten too off, far off reservation, then you're gonna let him go. So again, it, 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 it it's a function. I, in my world, I wish I would never do an employee security audit. Don't misunderstand me. Um, I love them. It gives me the ability to really sit down and play devil's advocate. And you know me, I've got an opinion about just about everything. So, uh, and I just love working with our credit unions and our owners, but I would like to work my way out of that. Um, I don't want to have to charge a credit union. And that's why Marvin and I lately have just been saying, get your team assembled. Uh, understand the hours and the input that it's going to take and we'll get you started, but then we're going to let you go on your own. And we've done quite a few of those. The other thing is categories. And I want to back up to that. After each release, we categorize the new tools it, by using this. So if you're the security officer and you're going to go, oh, another release. Oh God, what did they do now? Um, does somebody got the release doc? I need to understand the tool numbers. No, you don't. You just need to know that there are new tools in the release and it will just display those. And then you can assign these to employees. It makes release management much easier. Again, this is new. <laughs> so for those of you who are on today, um, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, questions. Um, Terry, let me get to reports uh, because these are important. Just type in security. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to go back in real quick. I'm going to assign tool 327 to Christian Daniel or Joe Smith. A lot of credit unions didn't know this existed. I'm going to assign him tool 327. And I'm going to click here and assign to employee. Did any of you know that there's a view only capability? Supervisors should have it. They don't all need to have security because they have to know what their people are doing, which then gives them the capability to change it. But supervisors should have 951. Um, and that answers the question. View only. So if you ever have to win the argument, well, I need it because I need to know what my employees can do. Well, I'd be happy to give you 951, but no way in hell are you getting 327. So, 
You don't want to gloss over that one. So I just always type in security. I'm a big one on the search. And it's tool 357. And you're going to hit go. And you're going to click on employee security audit report. This is the report that you would give to an examiner who says, um, show me all of your employees and the tools that they have. We redid it, okay, a couple years ago to make it a little bit more understandable, but it's gigantuan. Um, literally, this is not something you ever want to send to a printer. This is, this is a full red oak that you're going to be killing um, if you were ever to do that. My recommendation is that you would print it to a hold queue, uh, if uh, your instant queue, and then you would save it in a PDF format and then save it off and give it to the examiner in that way. There's no way in hell I would do it uh, via paper. Now, uh, Terry, getting to your question, um, if you just wanted to see what accounts, uh, what employee IDs, uh, what accounts are assigned to what employee IDs, you would run this report this way. <coughs> and that'll get you what you're looking for. And so what I recommend credit unions do is when they do that annual, it's time to check in to make sure that we're watching the accounts, um, they, they bring in all that paper that employees are filling out, they print this report out um, or save it in a PDF. You really need to print this one out. And then just check it off. Yep, yep, yep. The other thing, and please, 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 especially I'm, I'm saying this to help your audit department. When an employee leaves, but maintain, keeps their account, remove the two-digit ID. And I say that for my team, too, because we do employee account reviews. And chances are we're doing about 25 to 30 percent more work than is necessary. So the termination checklist that you have, uh, and by the way, Audit Link is publishing a termination checklist here in the next couple of weeks. You know how many times I get calls from people in the credit union world or QSO world? They had quite a bit of authority. They did something wrong. I had to term them. What applications should I consider? And I have like a list of 30. Payveris, Magic Writer. Credit unions frequently forget. That's going to be published here in the next week or so. Keep your eye out because I'm going to put an announcement out on it. So that's the security report. Now there's other security reports here as well. And you can do just the assigned tools report. That's per employee by one employee, and then the security maintenance report. What do would you use security maintenance report? Well, when you're done with your audit, what's proof? What's going to be the proof that you actually did it? Well, because I was in there and I changed all sorts of stuff. Eh, that's not going to cut it. Uh, the proof is that let's assume that you're doing this in January and maybe February because it's not your full-time job, but and you're updating all this. Your proof is this. You put the maintenance range in. And again, don't print this out. I mean, when I'm done with a credit union of average size, this is at least a 1,000 pages long of all the changes that were made. But it blows the examiners back in the chair when you show, here's everything I did. So that's the maintenance report. What else can the maintenance report be used for? Um, for those of you on, I do have a fillable PDF that can be used internally. I just, uh, as a matter of fact, I just had one of these uh, engagements with Department of Labor, Federal Credit Union, and Carrie was asking questions and I sent it to her as well. Um, it's a, a fillable PDF that supervisors would use to give to the security officer. And it goes into um, grant this tool to this employee for a period of time uh, for the next two months and then take it away. Or it says, grant this tool to all employees having that team. Here's the reason for it. 
and then you maintain those PDFs, and then on a quarterly basis, somebody says, okay, security officer, I'm printing off the maintenance report, now I'm gonna compare it to the authorization forms. It creates a process that is, is more thoughtful in the credit union. I would say 90% of you, how do, when, if I would ask you, how do you do this? Oh, I get an email. Uh, how would you justify the fact that you changed it? They just ask. Did they say why? I don't ever ask. Um, versus, no, they have to have justifiable, justifiable reasons for this. And we have a process not only for granting tool assignments, we also have a process then for auditing it. And we also have a process for terming. So think of it that way. Um, 327 just isn't a, hey, let's go into 327 and use it. That, that's not it. Um, if you all don't have a procedures manual for 327, you're probably a little behind the, behind the times. Uh, it, it is something that is watched by your regulatory body. Um, that if it is not watched internally, can create and pose additional risk because lack of segregation of duty. So, um, you know, if, you know, there's been three embezzlements a month. Now, there was an article that came out and said this is the lowest year of embezzlements um, in the last three years. I'm calling foul on that. It, it's not. It, they just haven't been caught yet. Um, people are working from home. They're doing stuff. Uh, and knowing Jim Vilker, I believe everybody can steal from credit union. Uh, and that's the way my team operates. So there's a, there, you know, the, the, the tool in and of itself, number one, find out who's got it. Um, some credit unions have used the management template. If you're using it, delete it. And if anybody's assigned to that team, delete it, the MG as well, because normally MG has 327 and you're hiring a new manager. So you give them a management template. You just gave them the keys to the kingdom. Um, it's not necessary and it should never be used. C level, VP level, um, don't have a team assignment. They don't. And at the C level, they really shouldn't have any dues uh, in, their, in their tool assignments. Is there any reason why a CEO in an average size credit union need, needs to perform file maintenance? Hell no. Um, but if you went into the CEO's two-digit ID, what you'd want to see is all the an analytical tools assigned to them, all the know your member, all the peer analysis, everything they need to understand what's happening in your credit union with your members and with your employees and with the operations itself. They don't need all the rest of that. And that's being looked at today. So where I usually see team assignments granted is branch manager and below. That's usually where I see. Um, and that would include loan officers. And it, it can get rel relatively granular. I'm a gigantic one on don't just have teller. You should have newbie teller and teller because newbies shouldn't have override. Newbies shouldn't have file maintenance because they're not familiar with the system. Teller, seasoned, has more authority as it relates to special security, maybe coded account adjustment. Then you'll have a head teller. So no less than three in the teller, in, in my opinion, no less than three. <clears throat> then loan officers, as you get into MSRs and loan officers and call centers, they're, you know, they sometimes become derivatives of each other in that we don't have loan officers, they're all MSRs. Or we have MSRs that are MSRs and tellers, and I run into this too, or MSRs with loan officers. Got it. Now, one, one more item before uh, I leave you for the holidays for you all is branches. Um, it's a three member branch and those people need to have a lot more. Identify those people, have branch teller, have branch MSR. They have to have a lot more authority and think of it this way. The more authority you grant and the less segregation of duty that you inject into the system, the more you are going to spend 
in audit. I.e., you know, that teller had to have general ledger posting. What? Well, yeah, they manage the ATMs. I don't care what it is. No, they don't need it. There is no reason in the world you can convince me a teller needs to have a GL posting. But by virtue of that, what do they have access to? Your inventory of cash. What do they have the right to do? Adjust 739. It's not a good situation at all. I mean, like I said, that is one thing. No one in this world will ever convince me that a teller should have GL posting. There is absolutely no reason. So, and my point is this, if, if you, you said, Jim, they have to have it, fine. Then who in the audit department is looking at all postings to 739 on that two digit ID? See what I'm getting at? So, um, you know, when a credit union wants to go concierge, uh, they have to have everything. We don't want the member to have to go from one department to the other to the other. Great, great member experience. But then you're going to have a body that you're spending money on because you've given them too many rights. And now I'm on my soapbox and I need to get down. So um, any other questions? I'm going to leave the mic open for another few seconds. I hope you all got something out of this morning's uh, meeting. It, like I said, this is being recorded. Uh, there's actually a recording out there. Uh, as it relates to employee security, but not quite as practical as this. Um, I'll probably take that one down. You can find the recording at auditlinksuite.com. Don't go searching for it uh, in, in other areas, just auditlinksuite.com. And it generally takes uh, about a week to 10 days uh, for it to be edited <laughs> uh, if necessary and go through the quality control. So with that said, Merry, Merry Christmas. Have a great holiday season. Um, enjoy yourself and your families. Um, and I'll probably see you all or talk to you all uh, next year. Take care, everybody.